to, to wrap up the Zali's legal theory, the court should deny uh, the Aroni claims, be correct reading of the bylaws, uh, and, and the nature of the Rebbe's authority actually gives the Rebbe unlimited authority. And they go on to make a First Amendment argument. And here, their point is, well, the First Amendment does observe a distinction uh, ex between uh, secular and religious realms as expressed in the principle of separation between church and state embodied in the establishment clause and that constitutional principle prohibits court involvement in religious disputes including matters of religious governance um, and this the Zali say that first amendment principle of separation of church and state demands that the secular <coughs> courts abstain from deciding any of the legal issues raised in the case um, which uh, to them is tantamount to deferring to the Rebbe's wishes. That's the Zali legal theory in a nutshell. <coughs> the Aroni legal theory is the diametric opposite. And I, here I think it's very interesting to see that in the briefs you see the Aronis speaking, claiming to speak on behalf of uh, 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 the Satmers and making representations <coughs> about what the Satmer culture and what its understanding of Jewish law is all about, they flatly deny the plenary theory of the uh, unlimited nature of uh, uh, the Grand Rebbe's authority. They deny that there is no religious secular distinction to limit the uh, authority of the Rebbe. And they say, contrary to the Zali's representations, that Satmers, in essence, actually do share the traditional orthodox conception, to use Suzanne's formulation, the theory of imperfect law. Um, they say this is expressed in the bylaws that were adopted voluntarily, framed by the Satmars, which expressly <coughs> limit the Grand Rebbe's sphere of authority to spiritual matters, and contrarywise give the board authority over secular matters, including matters of corporate governance uh, and, and procedures for the selection and removal of members of the board um, and, and property and business affairs and so on. Therefore, the Grand, the grand Rebbe had no authority to remove uh, Friedman if he even did so, which they also deny. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, they go on to address the First Amendment issue, and here they completely agree. Yes, the First Amendment similarly embodies the principle of separation between spiritual and, sexu and, and secular affairs. Um, yes, uh, this means that courts have to stay out of religious affairs, but courts can and must decide legal issues if they can be decided on the basis of neutral principles of law. And here, and here we've got them. We've got the corporation's own bylaws, which specify how selection and removal of board members is to be conducted. We have the pertinent statutory laws, the state corporation laws that govern election procedures of private corporations with respect to the validity of the deed. We have property law, um, and so on and so forth. So we can determine these claims, which ultimately will um, uh, uh, resolve the question of whether Friedman remained a member in good standing of the Sommer congregation and furthermore uh, retained the status and authority of president of the congregation. We can do all that on the basis of neutral, non-religious, secular principles of law without in any way um, uh, enter, having to enter into uh, uh, the merits of the succession battle itself. Uh, so the courts shouldn't abstain. In fact, abstention would be tantamount. There would be a judicial abdication of the important role it has to play in providing protection. Um, and, and indeed, if the courts do stay out of it, they'll be leaving uh, uh, members of the congregation without any protection against what they characterize as just a naked power play by the Zollies. Okay. Um, it's a big, huge mess. It's crazy. It's mad. Uh, forum shopping, shenanigans, verbal, physical intimidation of one another, of the court, of the clerks, of this, that, and the other. Um, I can't possibly summarize it, but I will say, as a result of the forum shopping, you ultimate, what you, one can't even say ultimately because there is no end to all this, but you do get two holdings, and uh, time is short. Um, in, in Kings County, going all the way up, Justice Barash essentially sides with the Zollies, says First Amendment requires abstention, principle of separation of church and state, so therefore there can be no ruling on whether Friedman was expelled or removed. <laughs> there can be no ruling on the validity of the elections. All of the relief requested by the Aronis and Friedman is denied on the grounds that A, the Grand Rebbe's authority is unlimited. So despite saying that there will be no substantive rulings. He actually explicitly endorses the plenary 
theory of the Grand Rebbe's authority, um, implicitly uh, uh, accepting the view that the Satmars do not recognize any distinction between uh, spiritual and secular jurisdictions and do not share the traditional uh, uh, theory of uh, imperfect law. Um, so A, that's one ground. B, the First Amendment prohibits involvement. And so we have to leave the status quo intact. Um, Orange County, long story, uh, Justice Rosenfasser comes out with another holding. I wish I could say more about it. What can we learn about it? I think there's a lot to learn, both about the impact of American law on Jewish culture, um, which I'm not going to end up saying much about, because I'm guessing my time is, I hope not already run out. Um, but, but so both about, we can see, we can learn a lot about the impact of American law on Jewish culture and in particular as illustrated through lots of interesting observations to make about the impact of American law on this one particular community, the Sotmers. Um, but I'm gonna focus my comments in closing more on the other side of the equation, which speaks more directly to the theme of this conference, which is the impact of Jewish law and culture on American law. So, I want to make a couple of points with respect to the impact of Jewish law and culture on American law that I think one can sort of glean from, from uh, these, these mad antic cases. The first point that I want to emphasize is the resonance and, 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 and near, if not total, identity between the American constitutional principle of the separation of church and state and the Aroni theory um, uh, or rather, yeah, the Aroni theory, which also posits a principle of separation uh, between secular and spiritual spheres, both within American law and within Jewish law, right? That is to say, we saw that the Aroni subscribe to the view that the Satmars share the traditional orthodox conception of imperfect law. Um, and I, I wish I could talk more about the details of that, but I'm what she said, it. what she said. And I'd be happy to answer more questions if I'm being too opaque. Now, what are we to make of the fact that the Aronis, that the Aronis have a theory of, you know, what we might call uh, idiomatically separation of church and state, um, which they impute to Jewish law on their understanding that so closely resembles our liberal, secular, American constitutional principle. Um, you might say, well, that's just, they're assimilating or absorbing or, or maybe just strategically using an American constitutional principle. You might see it as a purely strategic claim. They don't, that's not an accurate self-description of their own cultural beliefs, their own understandings of Jewish law, but it's strategic. You might think it's sort of a deeper internal, maybe they really do believe it, but that just shows the impact of assimilation. Um, and these aren't mutually exclusive options, but I think as Suzanne's comment suggests, and I keep coming back to this, we have to recognize that this is an authentically Jewish tradition, this, 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 this rabbinic theory of imperfect law, um, uh, which has as its key components, uh, uh, a it's a religious theory that says we need secular law. We need to recognize a distinction between the realms of secular law and religious law and protect both. Um, it's a position that I've written about elsewhere and, and sort of labeled either theological secularism or secularist theology, and we could talk more about that. Um, I'm gonna, to, to defend what I'm about to say, I'm not even gonna begin to defend it. So here's just my thesis. If we wanna talk about the impact of Jewish culture and law and American law, one thing we might say is, well, the conception of separation of church and state that's embedded in American constitutional doctrine and in liberal political theory more generally, I would suggest provocatively, I'm gonna go on a limb, but you could say that it derives from and indeed is shaped by traditional Jewish law, this traditional Jewish theory of imperfect law. Now here, if, if I'm making that claim that I'm talking about influence at at the level of very deep structure, right? And very deep history, right? I'm saying they're deep historical roots. And when I say deep, I mean deep. I mean, we're talking about a tradition that goes, you know, at least as far back as, as medieval rabbinic thought. Um, and, and really one can go back to the biblical sources that are relied on. Long, complicated story to tell. Obviously, if that's true at all, 
it's mediated through Christian sources and Christian theology, um, which articulates its own uh, version of the theory of imperfect law, its own version of what I call theological secularism or secularist theology, that is a religious argument for the necessity of secular law, for uh, the need to divide spiritual and secular realms and protect both. Um, there's obviously a very long, complicated, deep, deep, deep intellectual history story to tell about whether the Christian version and the Jewish theory uh, do they merely parallel each other? Are there actual exchanges? It seems to me from a little bit of reading that, that, that there are genuine exchanges such that one could support uh, some version of the claim I made. I'm not going to be able to support it now, so I'm just throwing it out to you. Happy to, happy to talk more about it. <laughs>